right. Good morning. Um, hey, this morning we're going to take a little detour. <laughs> we're going to jump out of the, the book of Colossians and jump for a week into the book of John. In John chapter 3. Um, and we're going to jump into it uh, because today... Uh, we are having uh, this morning and next service a, a, a baptism opportunity, and we got some people that uh, are looking to be baptized, and um, you know, the, and, and maybe there's some others out there. I don't know, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, and, and, and God just kind of led me to this text as I was trying over the weeks trying to figure out exactly what uh, text I would I, I would bring today. And and if you read ahead in Colossians into the next chapter, you'll know why. It really wasn't appropriate for me to, to preach baptism because if you really want to see some excitement, if you're really interested in what it looks like to see uh, what happens when you spray a water hose on a wasp nest, come back next weekend when I, when I read uh, where Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands and, and so forth so, and what that looks like. So yeah, you want, to come back, you want to see some good stuff, come back next week. That's all I got on that. It's going to be good. Hey, uh, don't worry, husbands. It says a lot more. Right? Right? So anyways, um, so we're going to be in John chapter 3. Actually, we're going to start, let me just say this, we're going to start in chapter 2 at the very end with verse 23 in there, but most of our times we spent in John chapter 3, and we're going to be talking about the, the story of Nicodemus. And some of you know the story of Nicodemus. Uh, some of you, it may have no parts of it, may have heard bits and, and pieces of it. But I think the story of Nicodemus takes us back, for me anyways, it takes me back to a, a, a place in my faith when, uh, when I was very curious. When I first started to follow Jesus and... and w- when Nicodemus is standing there in front of Jesus, I can, I can see my heart in Nicodemus. And I can see some of my ignorance in Nicodemus. You know, we like to look at Nicodemus and be like, man, you know, because let's be honest, like Jesus tells the disciples, you don't get it. And then he kind of gets kind of kind of uh, rough with Nicodemus at one point, you know, and, and we get to sit back because we have the scriptures. We have not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament, not just the Old Covenant, but the New Covenant. You see, we get to sit back and look and be like, yeah, they didn't get it. Those idiots. <laughs> but the reality is, is, is we have so much more than they had. Yes, they had Jesus. But the whole idea that the whole covenant, the whole, the, 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 the new beginning, the whole idea that Jesus brings to earth is so different than what they were used to knowing as they had just the Old Testament. And so when we hear the story of Nicodemus, I believe that if we're really honest, we can see a lot of ourselves in the story of Nicodemus. Amen? Amen. If you know it, I think you'll believe me. So we're going to begin with the end of chapter 2, uh, verse 23. It says this, says, Now when he was in Jerusalem, talking about Jesus, at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs that he was doing, okay, so they saw these signs, they saw these miracles uh, that Jesus was doing, and so they, they, they began to believe. Well, they began to believe because he was doing miracles. He was doing uh, pretty awesome things. It says, but Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. This is important because I want you to understand when you look into the Bible and you guys know those numbers you see, anyone, the numbers you guys raise your hands, everyone see numbers in their Bible. Okay. Those are, those are chapters. The big numbers are chapters and the small numbers are verses. And a long time ago, they decided to split the Bible up in chapters and verses. Now, when the letters were originally written, 
They didn't write them with those chapters and verses, okay? That would be like you and I writing a letter to our, our wife or to a friend and including chapters and verses. They didn't do that. Those were added later so that we could better understand. Sometimes, though, those chapters and verses actually do uh, create more difficulty and, and do more of a hindrance than they do good. And this is one of those cases because here at the end of chapter 2, Okay, this actually runs, this actually is the beginning of the story of Nicodemus. Because what happens is John is saying, what John is saying at the end of that is he's saying, look, Jesus, he's, he, he's there, okay, he's in Jerusalem, he's at the Passover feast, and, he, and John is saying, Jesus doesn't need him to tell anyone, he doesn't need anyone to tell him what's on the heart of man. He knows the heart of man before the heart, before the man approaches Jesus. Okay? You hear what I'm saying? He knows the questions that you have before you ask them. He knows your heartbreak even before it breaks. He knows your celebration even before you know to celebrate. And John is telling his readers, Jesus knows the heart of man. And right as he finishes that, because listen, get rid of that idea that John chapter 3 starts there because John chapter 3 actually started in in that text. Because right after he says that, a man shows up. And his name is Nicodemus. And it's very important that you know this. Jesus knew Nicodemus's heart before Nicodemus even showed up. And that's what John is telling us that Jesus knew what was on Nicodemus' heart before Nicodemus even showed up. He knew he was going to be there before he got there. He knew the question, in fact, we're going to find out here in a second, before he even asked it. So now we'll jump into what is labeled as chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, He was a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night. Now, I need to stop right there because you need to understand there's a a little play on words here with this word night because it actually has two different meanings. One is possibly that Nicodemus came at night. (laughs) You got me? The obvious meaning. The the, the sun went down, the moon was right, it was nighttime, okay? And Nicodemus shows up. And there's this idea that he showed up at night because he was going to talk to Jesus. Not in a sneaky, I want to trap you type of way, the way the Pharisees normally do, but out of genuine interest in who Jesus is. So he shows up at night. But there's also a play on the words because the words also mean, there's also, there's also this hidden meaning behind it that Nicodemus showed up in a spiritually dark place. He showed up in a spiritually dark place. Not that Nicodemus was this evil person. Not that he, he was a, a, a satanic worshiper or, you know, just kind of dark and stuff like that. Not that type of, type of dark, but the type of dark that he was a Pharisee. And you see, the Pharisees held so much onto the oral tradition of the law in other words, what happened is, and I'm going to explain this a little bit more, is, is that you have the written tradition and the oral tradition. The written tradition is, of course, the Old Testament. And the written tradition is, is, is the things that people brought themselves. And so they would add these man-made laws unto God's law, okay? And the Pharisees held a lot of weight in that. In other words, if you went and said, uh, you went and said, um, you were a rabbi and, and you went and taught an additional law on top of the Old Testament law, they would say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And so they would add these laws on top of God's laws, making, the, making them the law, okay? And so they didn't, he didn't really, he was all about the Torah, all about the law, and not about a relationship with God. So that's what I mean by a dark place. He was in a dark place. He says, he says, Nicodem- he says the man came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus came by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, Teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Hmm. Jesus answered him, listen, hold on. 
This is what I was talking about. At the beginning, what did John tell us at the end of chapter 2? That Jesus knows. Come on, people, work with me. I know it's early, it's cloudy, it's, it's we all want to lay down in the pew and go to sleep or seats, whatever you call these nowadays, okay? It says that Jesus knows the heart of man. Did anyone see a question in that text yet? There's no question. There's no question mark. Nicodemus hasn't even answered, asked the question and Jesus is answering it. Jesus knows the heart of man. He doesn't need to be told the heart of man. A man shows up. He has a question that he hasn't asked, but Jesus answers it anyways. Folks, Jesus knows your heart before you know your heart. He knows your questions. He knows your doubts. He knows your struggles. He knows your battles. I always find it funny. As a preacher in, in ministry for 20 years, I always find it funny that, that uh, I'll, I'll be with people, and sometimes they're church people, sometimes they're not, whatever, this or that. And they'll try very hard to watch their language. And then when they let it slip, they'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry, pastor. I'm like, Dude, why are you sorry? If you're going to, I mean, if you're going to say it, say it because God knows you're going to say it anyways and it has nothing to do with me. He knows it. He hears it. He, he, before he, listen, even though, even with all of that being said, with the fact that God, Jesus knows our hearts, knows everything about our hearts, even the things that we try to hide and we can't, I'm telling you, we can't. Jesus knows it. And even with that, he still loves you. He still loves you. And I need you to be bold in that and be confident in that. Because sometimes we get in a place in our walk where we don't intentionally say, oh, I'm going to hide this secret from Jesus. But sometimes I feel like we get in a place in our walk with Christ where we where we think we're hiding things from him, but we're not. And then sometimes I think we get in a place where, where we feel bad because Jesus knows that we have doubts. He knows that we have questions. He knows that we have concerns. I want to encourage you to not feel bad. Not feel bad. Listen, Jesus wants to walk through you with you through those questions and those doubts and those concerns. And I believe that when we're open and honest with them, when we seek answers to our questions, I believe in, in that questioning that God is honored and that he rises to the top and Jesus is glorified in our hearts. I really believe that. And it says, thank you for that one. It says, uh, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, we're going to stop right there for a little bit. We're going to camp there for a little bit. And here's why. Because I need you to know Nicodemus. And we've talked a little bit about him, but I need you to really know Nicodemus as much as possible because I believe by knowing Nicodemus, you get to know the heart of Nicodemus. And what you understand about Nicodemus when you know the heart of Nicodemus is you know that he's not approaching Jesus in a, in a, in a um, deceptive way. He's not approaching Jesus to trap him like the Pharisees had before and like they do and like they continue. He's not approaching Jesus in, in, in a, a prideful way. I believe that he's approaching Jesus in a very, very humble manner. He's very interested. He's very intrigued. He wants to know who Jesus is. And these are some of the things right there in those first few verses that we learn about Jesus is that he is a Pharisee. It's very important. Now, and when I say Pharisee, when I tell you that, 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 that Nicodemus is a, is a Pharisee, how many people, the phone, first thing, the only thing that really comes to mind is he's a religious leader. 
How many? Yeah? Give me a hand. Raise a hand. If I say to you, Sadducee, religious leader, right? And here's the deal. Most of the church in the world, in America today, re- relates Pharisee and Sadducee to that one title, religious leader. But there's so much more than that. And we need to know the difference when we hear it so that we can make sure we're understanding it in Scripture. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Of the Pharisees and the Sadducees made up the Sanhedrin. Do you know what the Sanhedrin is? The Sanhedrin is the governing body of Israel. They're the governing body of Israel. Okay? Now, the Sadducees, they held a majority of the 70 seats that made up the Sanhedrin. Isn't this stuff exciting? Maybe it's just me. I love it. <laughs> like, I'll probably get really excited about this. They make up, the, the Sadducees make up 70 seats, or a majority of the 70 seats of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Pharisees make up a minority. But the Pharisees most often win any debate or argument, even though they make up the minority. And here's why. Because the Pharisees, which is what Nicodemus was, okay, they are middle-class business-type owners. The Sadducees were upper-class land-type owners. So the Sadducees had a tendency to hang with people like themselves. The Pharisees were very popular and had a tendency to hang out in the, in, the, in the regular market amongst the commoners. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why they were very popular because they weren't upper class, they were middle class. Okay, they, they, they didn't, commu- they didn't uh, uh, keep company with just each other, but they kept company with the average person. So here's why we need to know this. We need to know this because we need to know that Nicodemus is out in the market, in the area, hanging out with people, and he approaches Jesus. So it really would not have been that uncommon for Nicodemus to be out talking and approach Jesus because he would have been used to approaching any rabbi or any teacher that brought something different to Israel. And the other reason they were so popular is that the Pharisees emphasized religion over politics where the Sadducees emphasized politics over religion. Okay. The other thing we know about Nicodemus is this, is that he was in a dark place. We talked about that. He was in a dark place. He focused more, just like all Pharisees, he focused more on the law of the Torah than he did on a relationship with God. He focused more on the outward action and obeying law and less attention on the inward transformation. Okay, okay. And then the other thing we know is that uh, Nicodemus had a respect for Jesus as a teacher and as a man of God. This goes back to what we were saying earlier, okay? Nicodemus respected Jesus. He calls him rabbi. He calls him teacher. Knowing that Jesus had no actual training to be a rabbi, he approaches him and he says, rabbi, teacher, He says, your teachings, he says, you must be a man of God. You must come from God because the signs actually point to that. So we know that that, that Nicodemus in his heart looks at Jesus and he respects Jesus as a teacher and as a rabbi, whereas most Pharisees did not. And we know that Nicodemus was intrigued, right? We've talked about it several times. He asked questions. He wanted to know who Jesus was and what he was doing there and and, and this new teaching that he brought. He was intrigued. Some of you know people who are intrigued. They want to know Jesus, but they have no one to answer their questions. Because when sometimes when, when new people come to Christ and they ask the most basic of questions, we have such a harsh answer. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to be that person where those who are seeking to know Jesus can bring their questions about Jesus. 
okay? And you may not have the answer, and that's okay. But you can find it for them. I want to encourage you, if you're sitting here today, if you have questions about Jesus, we want you to ask those questions. There's no silly question when it comes to trying to know who Jesus is. Nicodemus is intrigued. He has questions. But throughout the text, the thing you're going to hear, the, the, the thing that Nicodemus struggles with the most is this idea of being born again. Anyone remember where I was? Okay. So Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We got to stop. We got to stop. Jesus says, that which is, he says in five, he says, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now listen, there is not one theologian, there is not one person that can look at you and say, this is, they'll give their thoughts, they'll give their opinion. Listen, the word water there has multiple meanings. One of the meanings is found uh, in Ezekiel, and I've lost the text now, but it's in, it's in, it's in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, I believe it's Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, uh, where uh, they're talking about uh, uh, the sprinkling of water in a certain situation. It's not baptism, just so everyone understands that. Uh, but the other meaning of water is this, in this text. I believe that the other meaning of water in this, and we need to listen is the waters of baptism that John the Baptist did. And here's why I believe that. Here's why I know that. And here's why a lot of other people believe that. Because baptism has already been addressed earlier in the book, earlier in, in, in John, with ba- John the Baptist. This is, I want to say this, and man, I, I, I run it out of time. This is very important, okay? Jesus, listen, I'm baffled by this idea that we have to have a conversation about whether or not we have to be baptized. I just, I I, I don't get it. Why do we have to continue having this conversation about whether or not baptism is is what saves you? The problem is that our, our, our faith has become so westernized that we're having conversations, we're having disagreements in places where the writers of Scripture never thought we would have to have conversation. Because listen, when, when people came to Jesus in Scripture, these are people who take their walk or their religion, whatever you want to say, they take it very seriously. We've talked about the fact that there are all types of rabbis and all these rabbis had disciples. And the idea of a disciple is what? Is to be exactly like your rabbi. And anyone that would have wanted to be a disciple of Jesus would have never, ever, 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 ever in the scriptures, even today in the Middle East and other parts of the country, would never, ever, ever, ever have the discussion of, do I have to be baptized? They just wouldn't. We have westernized that. We have made that an issue that it shouldn't be. Jesus himself was baptized. He was immersed. He was dunked underwater. John the Baptist was the one. The, Jesus went to get baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, well, wait, you should baptize me. Jesus said, no. No, you baptize me first. It has to be done. So the question shouldn't be, do I have to be baptized? The question should be, are you all in for Jesus? That's the question that we should ask. Is this for Jesus or is this for myself? Because if it's for Jesus, then our desire is to be exactly like him. And so I believe that the word water there, and you're going to look, you're going to look in your ESV notes, your NIV notes, and they're going to say, oh, it's from Ezekiel 
Some of them say that. I don't care. There's a lot of others, including myself, that say it has a double meaning. And it means both. And I believe that with all my heart. He says this. He says, (laughs) that's funny. He says, do not marvel, better yet, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The word, ama- the word marvel right there is actually better translated. The, word, the Greek word is thamazo, which is better translated as to be amazed. In other words, do not be amazed that I said to you that you must be born again. In other words, don't be amazed by this. And the reason Jesus tells him to not be amazed by this, listen, the reason Jesus tells Nicodemus he shouldn't be amazed by this is because Nicodemus, as a teacher, as a Pharisee, as a teacher of the law, as a, as a, as a religious leader, however you want to word it, he should know Ezekiel 37. Anyone know what Ezekiel 37 is? Oh, you sing it. Anyone? You sing it and you love it. The Valley of Dry Bones. If you sing that song and have never read that scripture, you need to go read Ezekiel 37. That song will take on more of an impact than you ever thought it could. When God prophesies through Ezekiel that Israel will be given new life. Israel will be raised from the dead their bones will be add fl- now. Of course, this isn't a physical thing. Don't be getting all weirded out on me. <laughs> but God would raise them to new life. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, "Don't be amazed that I say this. You should know this. You should know that God wants to raise Israel to new life. That God wants to raise His people to new life. Don't be amazed by this." He talks about there at the end how the Spirit of God will go wherever it chooses and em- embrace whoever it chooses. And it, we don't know where it's going to go or who it's going to go. We can't go look at person and say, oh, that person is going to get the Spirit of God. And then Nicodemus, chap- verse 9, says, Nicodemus said, <laughs> John 3, 9, Nicodemus said to him, I've said to Nicodemus, the name Nicodemus a million times over the last two weeks. At one point, I was actually wrote this, this, this thing, and I was actually saying, talking about how the writer was Paul because we've been in Colossians so long. I'm like, Kenny, you can't do that. It's not Paul right now. We're in... Verse 9 says, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? He's confused. Listen, I know we like to jump on Nicodemus, and we kind of like to be like, dude, because look, look, Nick, look, Jesus is going to say, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, speaking about Jesus and his followers, and bear witness to whatever we have seen, talking about all the miracles, all the things that God is doing. But you do not receive our testimony. In other words, you don't believe us. We're telling you everything we've seen. We're telling you everything God is doing, but you're not believing us. And he says, you're a teacher of Israel. He says, How do you not know these things? How do you not understand these things? And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? I need you to understand Nicodemus' heart here. Yes, I know Jesus is like, hey, listen, listen up. And sometimes we've had that conversation, haven't we? I mean, with with, with people and, and, and people ask us questions and we're not trying to be sarcastic. We're not trying to be rude. We're not trying to be disrespectful. And I, and I don't believe Jesus is. Jesus is just saying, hey, listen to me. Nicodemus, see, Nicodemus struggles. Let's not be too hard on Nicodemus because Nicodemus struggles. He's lived his whole life understanding that everything about God is wrapped up in the Torah, in the law. You see, in Nicodemus' life, and again, I'm giving you a short version. There's so much more. In Nicodemus' life, everything has been up to this point about the Torah about fulfilling the law. If Israel could just 
uphold the law perfectly. If Israel could just fulfill the Torah, then the Messiah would come. You see, Nicodemus is struggling to get beyond his past. What about you today? Do you struggle to get beyond your past, the things you were raised in, the way you were brought up? Whatever that is, I don't know what your past is. You're struggling to get beyond it and into this place where Jesus is calling you to be. And you're like, Jesus, I don't, how can this be? How can this be? How can I get here when I've always been here? How can I be here when all I know is, how can I know this if all I've known is that? says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, Jesus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I'm not going to go into all that because that will take another 20 minutes. Okay, 10, but still But what the end of that is saying is this, is that Jesus is to be lifted up. Not just talking about his ascension. He's talking about being lifted up on on the cross. He's to be lifted up on the cross and then lifted up to heaven so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We have learned a lot of things about Nicodemus. I hope we have. I hope we have. In fact, later on, what we find out in John is this, is that Nicodemus, when the, when, when, when the Sanhedrin, and we know what that is now, when the Sanhedrin wanted to arrest and kill Jesus, Nicodemus, and said, Nicodemus stood up in that meeting and said, is it not against our law to go and arrest a man and have him killed without a trial, without evidence? And they get mad at Nicodemus and they pretty much tell him, sit down, we're going ahead with it. Then we also learn about Nicodemus that he shows up at the burial of Jesus with approximately 75 pounds of spices to assist in the burial of Jesus. Man, the heart of Nicodemus. When we look at his heart, when we look at his actions, when we hear his words, when we hear his questions, we can't help but look and see and feel a man that sincerely wanted to know if this Jesus was who he said he was. But there's one thing we don't know about Nicodemus. There's one thing we don't know about Nicodemus church is how his story ends. We don't know it. It's a big fat question mark. Did he choose Jesus? Was he baptized in Jesus? Oh, a lot of people would say, well, his actions would say that they were, he was. Listen. I know a lot of people in this world today that would say a lot of good things about Jesus but never make him Lord and Savior. Nicodemus' story to us is a big question mark. What about your story? What about your story? Will your story end with a big question mark or an exclamation mark? Would end intrigued about Jesus or will end knowing Jesus? Will end with asking questions about Jesus or will end with walking with Jesus? How does your story end? That person that does your funeral, will they have to say good things? Or will they get to say he followed Jesus or she followed Jesus? How does your story end? Because the way your story ends makes a difference in the end. It really does. If you want to make sure that your life, that your story ends with an exclamation mark and not a question mark, and we talk to you, listen, we want, and you're going to be baptized, uh, we're going to ask you, uh, where's Steph at? Is Steph, uh, he's over there. Um, I'm going to ask you to come over here to this front row. 
and, uh, and we're going to take care of that. Listen, maybe you're not prepared to be baptized today, but you're thinking about it, and some's got you thinking about it, and you want to come up and talk to Stefan about it, or myself about it. Man, here's the deal. These guys don't know it because I haven't told them. I will get this baptistry. I'll make Stephen get this baptistry out again next week. I will. I will. So, uh, you guys going to lead us in a song? Yes? No? I don't remember. Background music? Do You know, I'm not, not, I don't want to make this weird, but do we have anyone in this service that is wanting to be baptized today? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I accept him as my Lord and my personal Savior. All right, girl. Because of your confession of faith, and I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's good on me. You can, uh, on your way out, uh, Go ahead and give your new sister in Christ some love. Uh, before you do that, though, I want to remind you that we want you to get plugged in. Listen, this is a big part of it, okay? Coming to Jesus, walking with Jesus, making him Lord and Savior. But guys, it can't. We have to grow in Jesus. And the way we grow is by getting connected. This Wednesday night is our life groups here. Come and get connected. I know there's a ladies thing coming up. Get connected, ladies. There's men's Bible studies on Saturday mornings. Get connected, fellas. Listen, if it, if, it, if it all accumulates to this one moment, which is a great praise the Lord, okay? It's, we have to continue to grow. It can't be just about this one moment. We have to continue to grow. In order to grow, you have to connect. Get connected. Another thing real quick over there is we have our highlight ministry team uh, for the month. Uh, I believe, which one is it, Steph? Huh? Steven. Hospitality team. Thanks, Jade. Hospitality team. So go check them out. They need some help. Ask questions. Get signed up. I love you guys. Thank you for being patient with us. And get a trunk or treat flyer, too, and pass them out. Bye, Grace City. Love you.